היה לכם את הלאנץ', לפחות לחלק מהאנשים, ו... Uh, you had your lunch, and I'm going to quote our great late chancellor, who would say that, you know, you're more than welcome to eat inaudibly uh, during a, um, a presentation. So, to quote Rabbi Rachman, um, so I am going to, I think, open the lecture part of learn and lecture, of lunch and lecture, excuse me. Uh, and um, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Monique uh, Sikatz to introduce our speaker, Dr. Tova Ganzel. Monique. I'm uh, truly delighted to be able to uh, introduce Tova Ganzel for several reasons, multiple reasons. One is that this is a Torah Umada University, and much of the lectures of yesterday were on Torah Umada. And Tova represents the Torah of this session, and I represent the Mada of this session. The, um, in 1963, uh, when I first met Morty, um, I was a surgeon, an intern in surgery. In those days, uh, women, who went in, women who went into medicine were considered freaks. <laughs> surgery was unheard of. And um, I came here to Israel in my third year, and I only learned later that they had had a major conference prior to our coming to decide whether to swallow hard and accept women, you know, myself, or to cut off the affiliation with Einstein. They finally decided to swallow hard, and I came. And then um, I, got, I applied to Columbia for Chirurgia, and uh, they read me the letter from Professor Zaltz, which was my letter of recommendation. And it said, and they quoted it to me, and it said, I was the best intern Professor Zaltz had ever had, but over his dead body would he ever have a woman in his department. <laughs> okay, and they said, don't take it personally, but over their dead body would they ever have a woman in their department. F fine. So I can truly appreciate, you know, Tova's work and where she is at this moment. And she's done outstanding work and she's especially to enhance the leadership roles of women in Torah. A graduate of Bar Ilan Doctoral Fellows of Excellent Program, she is one of the first two Ya'atzot Halacha uh, who were trained at Nishmat in Israel. Last year, following a prestigious Tikva Fellowship in the United States, Dr. Ganzel returned to Bar Ilan to assume the directorship of the Midrashah. A dynamic, charismatic individual, she has published widely, is a sought-after lecturer, and is positioning the Midrashah to educate future women leaders to figure prominently in the public Jewish discourse. She will now address this forum on the topic, Revolution or Evolution, Women in Halachic Leadership Roles. Lots of luck, Tova. Thank, thank you very much. Um, our uh, l lunch and learn today, as they called it, um, will actually be a brief shi'ul, or a brief presentation, on how women actually um, developed into leadership positions in the Jewish world. Uh, you have in front of you source sheets. I will quote the sources and the, the bottom lines in Hebrew and in English. But anyone who wants to see the source, um, the whole source, you have it in front of you. Don't worry, we're not going to read it all now. Um, but it is important for, me to, for you to see the context. I think that the beginning of this question of revolution or revolution, women in halachic leadership roles, actually started, or a good example for the place it started, was in about 1919 in Israel, when elections were first being made for the first Mossadot of the Tzionim, the first um, you have to help me out sometimes. The first Jewish 
institutes, institutions, thank you, before uh, the State of Israel was actually institutionalized and there were no official positions, but there, had, there were a beginnings. Around the world at that time and those years, women weren't being elected or, did not, or were not taking any kind of positions, but not only that, they weren't even allowed to vote anywhere. Or very, very slowly in those years, they started getting the permission to vote. In Israel, um, this was a big challenge because this new country obviously expected women to have equal opportunities. But on the other hand, this was not a common uh, thing. It wasn't being done in most places. I won't even say that one of the latest places we all know women were able to vote was in Switzerland in the 70s. So if we go back to 1919 and 1920, women in these positions was definitely totally unheard of. Um, this obviously caused a big debate in the halachic rabbinic world and was addressed differently by different rabbis, which all addressed the same question. It all had two parts. Part one was, could women vote? And the second part of the question was, could they be voted for and sit as representatives in the new institutions? I will briefly give you ex a few examples of what were the rabbinic responses to this question. The first one you can see on your source sheet I brought here is the Radatz Hofman. His answer in 1919 or 1920 about the question, again, two sides of it. One, can women be elected? Two, can women vote? So his bottom line was, and I, I'll read it first in Hebrew, However, it is clear to me they cannot be elected based on the decrees of, rabbi, of the rabbis of the Talmud. So Radatz Hoffman looked at the question and said, okay, women can definitely go vote, but they cannot be elected. We don't have any uh, openings or leeways to allow women to be elected in our rabbinic sources. Um, he wasn't alone. The next example I brought here is Rav Kook. Rav Kook was even sharper. Not only did he not allow women to be elected to any public uh, jobs or any public positions, he also didn't think women should even vote. And he gives different reasonings, but I'll, again, I'm reading what's emphasized on your short source sheets and also is here on the presentation. The obligation of engaging in communal work is upon men. And he goes on saying, That the role of ruling, judging, and testimony do not apply to women. His reasoning um, had a few uh, different aspects. To First of all, Kvodabat Melech Pnima. A woman should be tsnu'a, should be mainly in her house. She shouldn't be going out to the public sphere. That's considered very inappropriate. But it's not only that. He also thought that if she'll go out to the public sphere and she'll start uh, even saying what she thinks a person should vote for, that will make conflicts within the family. Then people will start arguing. There might be tensions between husbands and wives. And therefore, he thought that could not be legitimate. Furthermore, he also thought that it's not enough for a woman to be going out into all these public positions and speaking in front of a mixed co-ed crowd like I'm doing here today. So for all these reasons, Rav Cook definitely thought that a woman should not vote and also should not be elected. The Sri Esh, Rav Weinberg, 12 years later, um, in, 19, in 1932, when already women were actually being voted for and elected, in some of the Mosadot Tzionim, in some of uh, these options that were there before the State of Israel was there, um, said specifically, women could vote, and you can see it in the, your source sheets, על דבר זכות הבחירה לנשים בהלכה כמישן בוועדה הלכתית של אגודת הרבנים באשכנז, they were talking about these opportunities, and he said specifically, even though he thinks that they could vote, but they should not be elected, he was the first one to write precisely, black and white on a halachic answer, what I quoted here, mitzad hadin en shum yesod leesor et abkhira. Really, if we check the halachic sources, which I'll touch on in a minute, 
There is no reason or halachic clear cut reason to say, whoop, what happened here? I need help. I don't have a pointer. Thanks. Um, can someone help me? Thank you. Um, perfect. So he that he so that so what he was saying was that even though he thinks women can vote but should not be elected, there is no halachic specific reasoning that he thinks mitzad din Torah that because of it a woman should not be elected. So of course we are see slowly. If I'm going back for a second to the title of my lecture, we see slowly that there is an evolutionary process that just happened year by year. But I do want to go back to the basis for a minute of the halachic debate. Why was it so not clear, or why was it so controversial, um, the question whether a woman could actually be elected, or the question whether someone else could vote for her? So if we talk about her voting, so we, I, I mentioned the reasoning that Rav Cook gave for not wanting a woman to be so involved in what happens in the public area. But if we're talking about her being elected, the source that was often being quoted was this Rambam that you have in front of you. You do not appoint a woman as a king, as it says king and not queen. And similarly to all public offices in Israel, one only appoints a man. So really the problem or the halachic source that was such a cause of debate was whether a woman could be appointed to what we might call public offices. The first one who actually dealt with it very clearly, which is very interesting, was Rav Uziel and his shoot. The reason this, his psak was very interesting was because he writes, uh, years later, that even though he published his answer in 1940, we're already, we're developing a few years later, he actually had written this whole answer for himself in 1920. But in 1920, he thought the time had didn't come to, publicize an, to publish an answer like this. I would also assume he didn't want to be on the other side of Rav Koch and Rav Weinberg and Rav Hoffman were publishing those years. But he, he testifies and he says specifically, I wrote this answer all out, but I decided to put it in the drawer. Now, 1940, the time has come, and I can tell you what I wrote then. What did he write? He wrote explicitly, first of all, that a woman can, be, uh, can vote, but also can be elected. And here I quoted the part where he actually mentions why he thinks the Rambam isn't relevant uh, when we discuss the opportunities in front of us in the modern Israel, then we were in 1940. And he's now discussing the Rambam. I'll, I'll translate it. There is one reason to allow elections today. Namely, that this ruling, the Rambam's ruling, applies only to the, sele uh, the selection via the Sanhedrin. If we'll go back to the Rambam for a, sorry, if we'll go back to the Rambam for a minute, you'll see the word ma'amidim. You do not appoint a woman. And what he wanted actually to emphasize, Rav Uziel, was that when we talk about appointing someone, it means someone from on top decides that this person will rule and be in charge of what happens in f for all of us. But Ma'amidin, the Sanhedrin, decides who will be put there and who will be making decisions for all of us is not the process which Rav Uziel thinks is happening in 1940. Because in 1940, women who come up to public positions are actually being elected. So since they're being elected, it means no one's forcing you to accept the leadership of a woman. It means that you actually chose to be led by a woman by voting for her. In Rav Uziel's eyes, that's a huge difference. And then he also goes back to dealing with what Rav Cook was mentioning those years. I said he wrote his answer in 1920, even though it was only published in 1940. And in 1920, he actually dealt with each one of Rav Cook's reasonings for why a woman should not vote or be elected. So the first thing he mentioned was, women in our, uh, in our, uh, 
lives or in the country, go out and run stores, go out and do asakim, he calls it mishar. So if they're out there anyway, what does it matter if they'll go out to the street and vote? Second of all, he says, if, we're wanted, if we want to raise a generation of people that know how to discuss things they don't agree about in a nice mitoch kavod, ahava, hadadit, that they learn to respect each other, then what we have to do by raising our children when the husband and the wife, like Rav Cook said, might not agree, how can you have such a controversy in one family, in one household, he, Rav Uziel said, this is the opportunity for us to educate our families, our sons, our daughters, our husbands, our wives, how to disagree in an honorable way. We shouldn't say they shouldn't vote because it'll make machloket, because it'll, uh, arguments will arise. We should say this is the opportunity to, to learn how to disagree. And the third thing he said was, from his personal experience, women are actually pretty good leaders. So that's Rav Uziel in 1940. I think after the tshuva of Rav Uziel, the state of Israel was actually institutionalized and it was much more obvious that women can actually uh, be elected and also obviously they were voting and that was pretty clear cut. But the next process that I want to go into and touch on very briefly is halachic leadership roles. But I started here to say that you can see very clearly over these 20 years that I demonstrated um, the tshuvot we saw that an evolutionary process um, just happened. It happened step by step and I don't think that when Rav Uziel published his answer in 1940, he knew to anticipate what would happen in 1960 or 1980, uh, but women were already being elected and being voted for. The next uh, uh, position that we see was dealt with as far as a woman uh, being in a, in a halachic leadership position is mentioned in a famous tshuva of Rav Moshe Feinstein, which I chose to quote today, since recently we all heard in the news um, that women are allowed uh, now in the chief rabbinate to be mashgichot kashrut, to double check in the, uh, the institutions uh, actually have what? Leor Amin Kaemuna. Leor Amin Kaemuna. Uh, the people who, very nice, Dina, <laughs> uh, who uh, pushed that forward, and it recently happened through the new hospice, uh, through the hospices of the new uh, chief rabbi, Rav David Lau. But he, it was an easy thing to accomplish if you wanted to find a source, because this tshuva of Rav Moshe Feinstein says, deals specifically with that question, with the question of can a woman, this woman uh, is a widow, she became a widow, her husband used to be the mashgiach kashrut, now she wants to do it because this is the only way she'll have parnasah. This is how she'll be able to actually have a living for her children. And Rav Moshe Feinstein says here specifically, first of all, we have to say, We can trust a woman. She's trustworthy um, of anything that has to do with halachot, that how you have to do something or can't do something, what's permissible and not permissible. But it's not only that. I'm turning to the top of page three, if anyone's following the source sheets. But he's saying, he says even more than that. Sorry. He says even more than that. And he also discusses the Rambam when he um, goes, elaborates on it. And he says, If we go back to the Rambam, maybe we shouldn't think that a woman can actually do this leadership position and be a mashgichat kashrut. But here's Rav Moshe's opinion. He says, But I really think this is not what the common or common knowledge was the way r the Rambam uh, put the what a woman can or can't do. Because if we check other people who related to what the Rambam actually said or quoted him or, or discussed his saying, they left the place of a woman, what a woman can or can't do, just for the first half. Just en ma'amidin isha b'malchut sheneemar melech velo malka. That's what we should learn from the verse or from the halacha. But to say also, to say that similarly all public offices in Israel, uh, you should only appoint a man, that thing, says Rav Moshe, does not, and he says it in very uh, explicitly, that does not have any source to rely on. And therefore, this Rambam, which we don't know what his sources were, 
is not something that we have to take into consideration even today if we, if we want to put this woman to be a mashgichat kashrut. He goes on saying how exactly it should be done, but the bottom line halachically is that he doesn't see any uh, reason not to. Recently, Arav Bakshi Doron um, also wrote a tshuva about 10 years ago, and he wrote, uh, discussing the question, could women actually be in leadership positions? And here we see it much more explicitly. Mikol ha'amur nira'a she'isha ve'ger yacholim l'shemesh kemanhigim ve'afilu k'gdolei ador she'koach anhagata mechayevet at ha'samchut. Isha ve'ger yacholim l'shemesh morei hora'a ve'lelamed Torah u'fsakim. Uh, you can see um, in your source sheets how he elaborates on that. But I think here we already see the clear-cut uh, situation where a woman can actually also teach. The last slide I want to point to is to say that even for people who feel that maybe uh, it's hard to accept a tshuva, a halachic answer from a woman, for even for people who feel that maybe the evolutionary process should be taking a few more years and we shouldn't be stepping so much ahead. Um, there's a Shulchan Aruch that says specifically, and for him, is a very uh, uh, complicated issue that not necessarily everyone would know to say what would be the psak is. But all you have to do is open the books in order to know what the decision is. This Shulchan Aruch is discussing what could a young rabbi uh, answer. And he's saying specifically that he doesn't consider it to be a young answer, uh, sorry, to be a halachic answer when all you do is pass on information that's given or written in the books that if someone else was learned enough, he could have known for himself. I want to just uh, finalize um, this brief shear to say that I really think that what we do in the Midrash in Barilan today is actually exactly that. It's enabling the girls to but in uh, taking their own credibility, their own knowledge in a way that they're actually empowered so they can go to the sources, feel that all the information, that all the halachic information, the Talmudic information is in front of them and be p as part of what they learn, part of their knowledge, become part of the halachic discourse or be part of the conversation. And what the minhag actually is in the halachic terms is also a legal source. When we go back to asking how should we act, what's the right way to act, the way people act or what people are doing by itself becomes a legal source, by itself becomes the next stage of how halacha is institutionalized. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. <laughs>